Good morning, everybody. Welcome here to our online gathering of Trinity Church. I hope you guys are safe and comfortable wherever you are at. And honestly, thank you for joining us this morning. It's such a blessing and an honor that you would uh, take your time at home to come here and watch this and be present with us here online. Uh, and I just hope that the Lord is blessing you during this time wherever you are at home. Uh, just a few announcements before we jump into the sermon. Uh, first of all, I just wanted to mention that I am producing a Google Doc, which you can download or open up, and it has sermon notes. So you can follow along with sermon notes, and uh, it has some questions, interactive elements for the things that I'm going to be preaching on today. And, and that will be posted with the sermon whenever the sermon is posted. Uh, you can download it, you can print it, you can just have it open in another tab. And I just want to have that there for you guys. Uh, if you're missing a bulletin or if you're the type of person who likes to have something to follow along with, I just want that there available for you. Also, uh, I wanted to again mention that the church has an online photo directory called Breeze. And if you go to the church website, on the top right of the screen, it says Breeze Database. And that's where you can put pictures of yourself, your family, put your email, phone number, contact information, address. And that's really important right now, especially for those of you who are uh, still at home, so that we at the church can contact you and to care for you. And, and if we want to send you information and updates about what's going on here at the church, we really need accurate information there. Uh, if you don't feel comfortable going on to Breeze yourself and editing your profile, Beth Bellows has offered, just call the church and she'll just take care of it for you. Just call the church, call Beth, give her all the information and, and she'll do everything for you. Um, it's super helpful for us to have accurate information on Breeze and in long term it's beneficial for you as, as we hope to be reaching out to you at home to care for you and to show you that you are loved and not forgotten. This week, uh, we had Feed America back here in Stanton, Michigan. We were at the high school again this week, and Chris got us some uh, drone footage again. And you can see that our team, along with the team from the Congregational Church and uh, the other volunteers, were there providing food for over 100 families. And we're able to do this because of, of you, you guys giving to the church still at this time and supporting the church through all of this uh, there's incredible need out there in the community and in the world. I mean, unemployment is at record highs, and uh, this impact is going to be lasting over the next year or two years as you know the economy starts to rebuild. And we want to be the church during this time, loving and known by our love for the people and trying to meet their needs. And, and we're able to do that because of your giving. So if you are still giving to the church, you can do that online or by mail. And uh, we really appreciate that, and thank you for your generosity. Uh, also, uh, one last announcement. The health team that the church has set up is still meeting regularly, almost weekly. And the health team is trying to determine when and how various ministries of the church can safely open back up. Things like the downtown children's ministry, things like the, the Ignite student ministries, the youth group, and things like our Tuesday night volleyball. We're trying to figure, the health team's meeting and they're planning the safest, most God-honoring way to uh, get these things back up and running. So uh, definitely update your information in Breeze and stay tuned in to the church Facebook page as we hope announcements about these things will be coming soon. And one final announcement is that Chris and Rich are still working on getting our live streaming up and running for here at the church. We had Cass Air was out here and installed a cable here in the sanctuary uh, for the sound booth that we can get a new computer hooked up with the new technology to get that live streaming. So every week we're making progress on that and it's really exciting and I can't wait until we have that available for you at home and online. All right, that's all for the announcements and now we're going to get back to the three-part series, A New Command. If you have a Bible, you want to open up to John 3.16, and we'll be looking at that in just a moment. But, first of all, last week we began a new three-part series on love entitled A New Command. We looked at 1 Corinthians 13, a beautiful passage going through love and what love looks like. And love is this great force of unity that unifies the church. 
A church is built in love around a shared faith and a shared hope. So we're going to be looking at this love and asking, okay, but what is love? What is love? We're going to start in John 3, 16 through 17, and we're going to follow that thread of Christ's love for us and analyze it to see how Christ's love for us is going to define and show us what love is. All right, John 13, 34 through 35 is the foundation of this series. A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Our focus today, as we look at what is love, is on on this singular line from this passage. As I have loved you, that is how we are to love one another. As I have loved you. So how did Christ love us? What does Christ's love for us look like? What did it do? If we can't answer these questions, then we don't know how we should be loving to one another as Christ commanded. So let's begin by looking at John 3.16-17. through 17. This is the first verse for many of us who grew up in church or have been involved in church for a long time. This is the first verse that we memorized as kids, right? John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his own, one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. We all know this passage, or we're all at least somewhat familiar with this passage, because it's a central feature of the gospel. This is the bedrock of the truth of the gospel, God's love for the world. God loves the world. God does not hate this creation that he has made. He made the universe. He breathed it and spoke it into being. He called it good and very good because he loves us, because he loves what he made. God loves the world. He loves his creation. He loves us. He loves you and me. This is bedrock gospel. God gave, we received, we are saved. How does love, how does God's love do that? How does it just do that? Just by loving us, how does, in receiving that love, how does that save us? How does that change the world? <clears throat> in considering God's love for us, we see four things that this love is and does. These four things are God's love for us is freely given. He gives it freely. God's love for us is sacrificial. It cost God. It hurt God to love. It's restorative. God's love restores and rebuilds relationships. And God's love for us is formative. It creates us into something new. And so our love must be the same, freely given, sacrificial, restorative, and formative. As we get into these four things, let's look first of all how it's freely given. No passage that I can think of more clearly demonstrates how God's love is a free gift than Ephesians 2, 4 through 9. Ephesians 2, 4 through 9. Because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. Skipping to verse 8. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. God's love is not earned. God's love is not withheld. God does not withhold his love from anyone. God's love doesn't demand anything from us when we come to him. Love is, God's love is rich in mercy and it's full of grace. Love is the great equalizer. Consider John 3.16 again. God so loved the world. God's love is for the entire world. 
No one people or nation can claim to be more loved by God than any other. May our love be the same in this world. Of course, in offering love freely to all without reservation, we're not naive, we're not stupid. People will take advantage of us. People took advantage of God when he offered his love freely. This is why, point two, God's love for us is sacrificial. This is why God's love for us is sacrificial. God knew coming as a man, coming as Christ, Jesus Christ, fully man, fully God, in human, in human form, God knew we would take advantage of him. But he loved us anyways. One of the most remarkable passages in scripture, Romans 5, 8. But God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were still yet sinners, Christ died for us. I get a shiver every time I read that passage. While I was still a sinner, Christ died for me. Christ's blood is on my hands, and yet he loved me and gave himself for me. I consider Jesus on the cross in the Gospel of Luke. He records that Jesus uh, cried out, Father, forgive them, looking down on the people crucifying him. Forgive them, for they don't know what they are doing. I read 1 Peter 2, 23. Peter wrote of Christ, When they hurled insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. God's love hurt. We killed God on the cross. We murdered the Son of God through our sin. And he took it. He took it out of love. And he took it not screaming and shouting and fighting tooth and nail the whole way. He took it non-retaliatory. He suffered by making no threats of his own. He did it out of love. And this is where we see the true power of God's love really starting to work. Because three days later after we killed him, he rose from the dead. God's power is restorative, life-giving, relationship restoring. <clears throat> so while the world, the world might scoff at this love, at Jesus' non-retaliatory love, and at, on the cross they mocked him. If you're the son of God, why don't you take yourself down off the cross right now? They missed it. They missed God's love. They might call it naive. They might call it weak. But God flips that script. Here in Luke, I'm gonna, Luke 15, 21 to 24, we have Jesus' teaching on the prodigal son, the parable of the prodigal son, one of Jesus' most famous parables. Here is where we see that script being flipped once again. Jesus doesn't use the word love in this parable, but he shows it in a way that's more powerful than ever what words could ever show, would ever say. And in this parable, Luke 15, 21 through 24, the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet, bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For the son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. This love that, that redeems and restores, it's, it's shocking, it's scandalous. If you read on in the parable of the prodigal son, the, the father here had an older son, and there was an older brother, who could not accept that his father was so forgiving and so loving of the younger brother. He could not accept it. But we must accept it because this is God's love for us that has transformed us, that has restored us. This must be how we love as well in the church as we love one another with forgiveness and grace and, and res seeking restoration in our relationships. Doing so changes us. And this is the last of the four things that God's love is and does. 
It's formative. It restores us to him, and then it forms us into something new, something different. In 2 Corinthians 5, 14 through 20, Paul writes this, For Christ's love compels us, because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. Skipping to verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone. The new is here. And all this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. God's love for us, it changes the foundation of our identity, our individual and corporate identities, to that of beloved child of God. This is something I always try to share with the teens at least once or twice a year. Their identity in Christ, who they are, who they need to find themselves in, is that they are a beloved child of God. That is essential bedrock of our identity as Christians. It is the first thing God does that transforms us. And it gives us a new purpose in this life. Purpose flows out of identity. And if our identity is a beloved child of God, then our purpose is to share that love, this overpouring, overflowing love of God in this world, to be Christ's ambassadors. It's not to live for ourselves. God does not give us license in this life to make it all about me and ignore others. It's about living for others. As everything we are, everything we do in this life, everything you think, everything you say, everything you post is a reflection of God. Because we are Christ's ambassadors, transformed by his love. And so we've come full circle. We've come full circle. We are now back to where we started in John 13, 34 through 35. A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. And by this, everyone will know you are my disciples if you love one another. There is no better way to be an ambassador of Christ than to show how much love we have for one another in the church. God's love for us was freely given. And so, in the church, our love for one another must also be freely given. And we must not withhold it. God's love for us is sacrificial. It cost him something. And so our love for one another in the church also must be sacrificial. God's love for us is restorative. We have new and right relationship with God. And so, too, we should see that occurring in the church, that our love restores us in relationship with each other. And God's love is formative. It changes who we are, inspires us to go and share that love in the world as ambassadors. And so, too, our love for one another should also be overwhelming, overflowing, inviting to the world. A testimony of the gospel. Well, let, me, let me close in prayer and then we'll be done for today. Jesus, Messiah, King of Kings, thank you for your love for this whole entire broken world. Thank you for your love for us in this world, you gave of yourself freely. You surrendered yourself to suffer deeply by our own hands. And yet, here we are, Lord, your church, your, your gathered body, redeemed by your love. And this is why we gather. This is why we worship. This is why we love. You are the master. We are the clay. Shape us and form us into the image of your Son, into your love. May our love reflect your glory in this dark, dark world, in these dark, dark days. 
And may we endure any and all suffering that we experience during this time, not in retaliation against it, but enduring this suffering out of love so that we may be a testimony to you. In your name we pray, Lord, Lord Jesus Christ, your name, amen.